from 1980 through the year 2001. You probably heard it on the radio or on TV several hundred, if not thousands of times, be all that you can be. It stayed around for 21 years. It preceded, actually it followed uh, a 1971 version of which was uh, Today's Army Will Join You and followed by a slogan, An Army of One. And neither one of those two lasts as long as be all that you can be. Probably because not only did it induce and inspire young men to join the Army, but probably it inspired some people who already were in the Army and perhaps even some people who had recently left the Army a few years earlier. We're going to talk about that today. Now the Army was trying to tell people, young men, that if you don't want to be a soldier all your life, we'll teach you a trade, we'll teach you a talent, we'll bring the best talent out in you to make you do really well with your life after you leave the Army. That's exactly what happened to a young man we're going to talk about today. A young man born in South Texas in the town of Poteet in Atascosa County, just south of San Antonio. His father was a school teacher by day and sort of a rancher by night. He worked or owned, he didn't own a ranch, but he managed a ranch uh, near a town called Big Wells, Texas. When this young man was very young, his father and mother, whose name was Doris, they separated and divorced. His sister went with his mother. He and his older brother moved with their father to a town called Pearsall, Texas. And this young man grew up on a ranch, in a ranch setting. He learned how to ride a horse at a very young age and probably had his life set on becoming either a rancher or a veterinarian. Funny thing about it was he never really listened to the radio. He didn't know a whole lot about music. His, his idol for a young country boy from South Texas, born in 1952, on that May 18th, 1952 day, his singing idol was pretty much Frank Sinatra, which didn't seem to make sense for what would happen to him. But anyway, uh, he went to high school. He learned to play the coronet in high school, and he eloped with his girlfriend, her name was Norma, in late 1971, and sometime between 1971 and 1972, not quite 20 years old, he joined the Army. It was in, This was the wind down of the Vietnam era, and by 1972 he found himself stationed in Hawaii at a place called Schofield Barracks. Now, he was 21 years old when all of a sudden he found out there was an opportunity for him to get into music. That is to say, there were these bands being organized. There was this band called Rambling Country, and they liked the way he talked. He said, I bet you could sing, because you're a Texas boy, the way you talk, I bet you could sing. So he, he went and purchased a, purchased a cheap guitar and some Hank Williams songbooks. The next thing you know, he's singing lead with this band called Rambling Country, but the band only lasted about two months. And then about six months later, the post commander auditioned for a big band that would fill the entire base up. So he had an audition for that band. And he got the role, and he spent the final year of his Army enlistment being a lead singer with this band that called itself Santee. He got out of the Army in 1975, early in 1975, and he stuck around Hawaii for about six months because this music bug was starting to bite him. I mean, after all, the Army had given him a trade he could use, a talent he could use, besides shooting guns and dodging bullets. But then he went back home, he enlisted and enrolled at San Marcos, in San Marcos, Texas, at a state which is now called Texas State University. It was then called Southwest State Teachers College. He wanted to pursue an agricultural career and get an agricultural degree in managing ranches and pretty much following the same suit and line of work as his dad was doing. And so, but he also had that music bug. Now, about a year earlier, in San Marcos, there was another school teacher, just like this young man's dad. Oh, by the way, I'm gonna tell you his name now. His father's name was John Byron Strait. His name is George Harvey Strait, if I don't break the whole code here. But in June of 1974, uh, a school teacher, a mathematics teacher in a junior high school by the name of Kent Finley, 
had a music bug in him. And he, along with a columnist for a local paper, the San Marcos Daily Record, his name was Jim Cunningham, they saw this old dilapidated warehouse on a street in San Marcos called Cheatham Street. Old beat-up warehouse, they could rent it for next to nothing. So they rented the place, leased it, signed a lease on it, fixed it up a little bit, and turned it into a by God live, as you look at, honky-tonk saloon. Yeah. Yeah. About six months later, one of the popular bands there was a band called Stony Ridge. Stony Ridge consisted of a lead guitar player named Ron Cabal, a bass player named Terry Hale, a steel player named Mac Steele, or Mac, I'm sorry, Mac Daly, and a drummer by the name of Tommy Foote. And the lead singer was a young man named Joe Dominguez. Now, are there, is there anybody here that's a Beatles fan? Anybody? Yeah. Are there a Beatles fan? Okay. Yeah. Are any of you familiar with some poor guy that used to play drums for the Beatles name? His name was uh, Peter Best. Does, anybody, does that ring ring a bell? Name ring a bell all anybody. Peter Best. There's a policeman back there who's heard of Peter Best. Peter Best, folks, preceded Ringo Starr as the drummer for the Beatles. It's one of the hard luck stories of the 20th century. Well, this is your lead singer for this Stony Ridge band kind of became the country version of pop music in the Beatles, Joe Dominguez, because in the fall of 1975, he decided he either quit that band or got fired or something, but all of a sudden, in the fall of 1975, he was no longer the lead singer with the Stony Ridge Band. So the Stony Ridge Band decided to audition some people, and the audition was won by this young agricultural student from Pearsall by way of Poteet named George Strait. So the next thing you know, George Strait, the date was October 13th, 1975, George Strait and this band Stony Ridge, they debuted at Cheatham Street Warehouse and they played about 50 shows. Then they started to drift back to the southeast toward Huntsville and Houston. They became popular, regionally popular, between, oh, I'll say, central Texas and southeast Texas. Now there was one of these bar owners, one of these clubs, not at Cheatham Street, but one of these places between Huntsville and Houston, his name was Irv Woolsey. Irv Woolsey. If we have a test on this show, remember that name, Irv Woolsey. Irv Woolsey had worked as an executive for MCA Records in Nashville. Don't know why exactly why he decided to become an entrepreneur and run a beer joint, but that's what he was doing. And uh, so he worked out an arrangement for this band to cut a record in Houston for D Records, owned by Pappy Daly, who had introduced Lefty Brazil to the world at one time. Well, they cut six songs. They didn't sell any records at all, but young George Strait went to his band members and said, look, men, I know you guys hired me. I'm your hired hand. But I think I've got a plan for us to make us a little money and have some success. If you'll listen to me, listen to my plan, my proposal, from now on, we're not going to go by any band name. We're going to go as a solo act. The solo act will be George Strait. I'm going to rename this band the Ace in the Hole Band. And you guys will stay with me. I think we can do some record work. When we cut these D record, people are going to hear us. They're going to like us. But this is the deal. It's a solo act. It's no longer a band advertised as a band. If anybody's with me, it's kind of like William Barrett, Travis the Alamo. If anybody wants to walk away from this deal, cross this line here. None of the band members crossed the line. So there they were, George Strait and the Ace and the whole band. But they didn't very fare very well. And by 1979, George had his degree, got a chance to work a ranch, manage a ranch out in Uvalde, Texas, being, and work for an architect designing ranches. He pretty much was getting ready to quit the music business when his friend Irv Woolsey came along. He said, I've got some Nashville contacts. From Nashville want to come down here, you play. And so this happened. And so when there was that spring of 1980, once again, the ad was being run on TV, be all that you can be. And George Strait, who had been out of the Army for five years, he took it seriously, because he and the A's and the whole band went to Nashville. They signed a deal with MCA Records in the spring of 1981. And by the late spring of that year, they'd recorded a record called Unwound, which went to number 10 on the Billboard country charts. 
Their next song, next song was called Down and Out, which went as high as number 16 in the early part of 1982 off of the album called Straight Country, its first album. Uh, they recorded a number three record. It's called uh, If You're Thinking You Want a Stranger, in parentheses, There's One Coming Home. Then the next year he recorded another album, and then in 1983, a big break happened for George Strait. There was a very popular singer then named Eddie Rabbit. Now George Strait was a rodeo cowboy. He was participating in roping events throughout the state as well as singing. And so at the Houston Livestock and the Livestock Show and Rodeo, which is a big event in Texas every year, right after the stock show in Fort Worth, Eddie Rabbit was scheduled to play a date there, and all of a sudden he had the flu, and they needed a quick replacement, a 24-hour or less replacement. Somebody thought of George Strait. George Strait drove down to Houston, went on stage, and has been playing the Ast well, until the Astrodome was shut down there in Reliant Stadium now, but it would be the first of many times, 20-plus, that George Strait would fill the Astrodome playing shows there. That was a huge break for George Strait because his next album took off and sold well. He had five straight number one records, biggest of which was probably Does Fort Worth Ever Cross Your Mind. And his first number one record was Fool Hearted Memory, which came out in 1982 off the, very, off the second album. And the string continued. Uh, as we talk now, George Strait, who turned 62 today, which is why Governor Rick Perry decided to decree this day as George Strait Day, now and forever. George Strait will conduct and conclude his final concert tour ever, he says. It's called the Cowboy Rides Away Tour. It's going to be on June 7th out at Jerry World, out at AT&T Stadium. This is scheduled to be the last concert that George Strait ever does. But in between that modest beginning, beginning when a young man didn't really know what he wanted to do with his life until he joined the army. Here's what George Strait has done since. Of all the musical acts in every genre in history, any genre, only two acts, entertainment acts, have sold more records than George Strait. They are Elvis Presley, you've heard of Elvis Presley, and they are the aforementioned Beatles. George Strait is in number three position, and he's closing in, folks. George Strait has sold over 70 million records. He has been the Academy of Country Music Award Entertainer of the Year three times, and the Academy of Country Music winner twice. And last year, in his 61st year, he became the oldest entertainer to win the both awards, the CMA, Country Music Association Award, and the ACM Academy of Country Music Award at age 61. The previous oldest winner had been somebody from Abbott, Texas named Willie Nelson who won the 1983 CMA Entertainer of the Year Award and the 1979 Academy of Country Music of the Year Award. So that's pretty much what the deal is. George Strait is, he broke Conway Twitty's record. He's, he had over, at this point, in, in 2009, he broke a record that many people thought would never be broken. Conway Twitty had had 40 number one records in two different genres, pop music or rock and roll, and country, and also five of these records had been duets with Loretta Lynn. George Strait smashed that record that year when he went from 40 to 44 billboard country chart-topping chart records. When you consider all the other musical charts that are out there, George Strait now has 60 number one records. That's a record that may never be broken. Anyway, we're gonna have a band follow me on this first celebration of George Strait Day in Texas. Y'all hope, hope you enjoy on this historic day to see the acoustic sound hounds, my friends, are gonna play some bluegrass like you've never heard it unless you were here last year. And this time it'll be even better than it was last year. So with uh, that ado, I'm going to introduce my friends, the Acoustic Sound Hounds, and all you folks have yourself a historical day. My name is Lee Powell. Bye-bye. Happy yeah! trails. <laughs> Lee Powell, everybody, give him a big hand.
Who needs encyclopedias when you've got Lee Powell? That's right. <laughs>